where does uh, the stuff that you like to play and that I like to play, which are different things, but um, are along the same lines, where do these things fit into musical programming? Can you still go to Carnegie Hall? Do you still do people still want to go to Carnegie Hall and hear the the, the Bach cycle, or do they want to go and hear a Bach suite and then a commission and then? Where where does the music fit together? Do we have separate paths, or is should everything be sort of this wonderful, cohesive amalgamation of thesaurus words? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll start with this, which is advice I got from Rhonda Ryder, which is always good. Um, I almost spit out my coffee. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry Rhonda. I've always wanted... I, I When I was studying with her in my master's, I wanted to do a concert of all women composers by all women performers. And so it was like a showcase of women in music to like highlight, you know, their achievements. And I was telling her about it and she was, you know, of course always supportive, you know, like she is, but at the same time made the suggestion that was very interesting to me that it's not necessarily helpful to do like a separate, um, to separate, because there's this undertone that, oh, well, we have to do them alone because they can't stand up with the big boys, right? What, what that has led me to, to kind of um, make my musical choices with is that um, I, I think it's mostly important just to learn about a lot of music. Mm-hmm. And the more stuff you know, the more pieces you know, the more repertoire, the more composers – you're better equipped to make excellent concert choices, regardless of what era it's from or anything like As that. As a result, every time I program a recital, I pick rep that I really want to play. And in the end, after I pick my rep, I've kind of wrapped it in a theme, whatever. I look and I try to, and there's always a woman composer on that list. And I'm not trying, I'm not like, you know, affirmative actioning in women composers or like trying to like force it to make a point. It's just happening because I've really educated myself on what they have to offer. But I feel like that translates better than being like, well, this is what I should play. I want to make sure I have a slow piece and a fast piece. And you know, Um, when I'm programming, I'm tending to find things that are either complementary or no, this sounds ridiculous, but complementary or completely uh, uh, contrasting sound worlds. Yeah. I want to find, if I'm playing a new music concert, I want to find a piece that's really... <laughs> and, but then I want to find something that's going to punch you in your face, too. Um, I, I want... So that's why I think that Bach and Boulez go so well together. Or, right. you know, uh, John Harbison's Abu Ghraib, along with... Uh, well, Bach again. Uh, or a Beethoven sonata. Um, or a Bach gamba sonata or something. But where I have a problem is convincing audiences that this is something that they want to listen to. Yeah. So everybody wants to hear that first box suite that I just played. And that's right. really nice. And now you've got them in their seats. But now I'm going to play some Ned Roram. I, I mean, there's so many ways to do it. Uh... <laughs> and yet I can't find one. <laughs> I think, I think, so I'll just like kind of give some broad things to think about. Um, the first thing is always respecting your audience mm-hmm. and believing that they can understand it, right? Like yeah. that's a super important first step, I think, because if you kind of believe in your heart that they're not going to get it, um, there's something always kind of patronizing that will come through, I think, in like mm-hmm. the way, uh, the way you talk to them, like, because you don't want to talk down to an audience. You want to talk to them like people that are are equal, because they are. And they're perfectly as capable as understanding the music as you are. And another analogous thing is that um, you don't consider your speaking educational. I think, yeah. Because <laughs> I think that's the way it's often presented to people. You speak to audiences so you can educate them or so you can teach them things, right? That that would be kind of the less obvious way of saying educate them, that I'm going to teach them about this music so they can understand it. And um, I think that that way of thinking about speaking to audiences leads you to, can lead to a lot 
of traps. That they're not going to be able, uh, they're not going to find it helpful to listen for a technique. Unless it's like a marker that they can help like track a piece. For example, an extended technique. That's cool, right? So that they can listen for it. I, th I guess like the last thing I would say is something that I've been kind of obsessed with lately is so how do you think about talking to people if it's not education, right? You're not teaching them things. What are you doing? What, what is this speaking doing? And it's doing a lot of different things, but I think the best encompassing term that I found for what it's doing is providing people with access. You're, and that happens in so many different ways. First of all, just hearing your voice makes people like you better. And when people like you, they want you to succeed and they're interested in what you're doing. I mean, and these are very like small levels of all of this happening, but it's happening. And when you're talking to someone, you're connecting with someone through your, your voice, like we are now, um, that they are more open to, to accessing what, to accessing what you're, you're about to share. Right. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And, and I do it because it's sort of this expected thing. I guess, and, and I want to try and make a piece of music more accessible to an audience member, whether um, it's Bach or whether it's Boulez. Um, and, and this is something I've talked with Scott Klipstall, your teacher, um, about, <laughs> where we kind of came to the same conclusion that we hate it. Um, yeah. and, and, it's really not for everyone, and that is fine. <laughs> I'm just not a person. It's not natural to everyone. It wasn't natural to me at first. Um, 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 upbeat, crazy, you know, mumble, mumble, so can't really like it. You have to have people who are willing to buy your product, your yeah. product being the music that you're playing. So I think this is all a big problem. Um, somebody just did something on Twitter. <laughs> I, that's and I, I think it's such a complicated problem that I can't claim I don't have an answer to it either. All I all I do all I know is that I've been working t I've been trying to work towards an answer and I think sometimes that's more important than having the answer because I'm not sure that there is one. I don't know. When I started with that, how I connect with audience members, that led me into a lot of things about access like we were just talking about like speaking before, all these different things, but then there's a the second question which gets into the more business side of things, of how do you get an audience member from one concert to the next concert? And I think that really changed a lot of things to me, for me, and I don't know why it took me so long to think of that as like a question that I could, should be concerned about, but it's really the crux of it. How do you get someone from one concert to the next concert? And I think there are a lot of different solutions, but maybe that that's a thing to focus on rather than, um, how do I get audiences? Just the smaller one. How do I get them to come to the next one? There's another problem with education um, in that when, you, when you're in school, from your freshman year until the last year of whatever degree you decide to finish, or whenever you finish school, whatever that is, um, the educational system, first of all, requires that you schedule a recital and you do one recital. So my sophomore year, I'm going to do my sophomore recital. So you spend the entire year working on this. You have a built-in audience Yes. at a school. It's your friends are going to come to your concert because they're going to come, because they feel obligated to come to your concert, whether that's to get out into the real world. And now we don't know how to do anything because right. people just come to concerts. They just show up when you're in school, um, whether it's because you're a friend of a person or because you need, uh, in many cases, concert credits for yeah. your degree or whatever, you just show up. Is it about promotion, um, you know, the PR side of things, which is the business thing, or is it about the what you're actually doing when you're on stage, your product? Is, is your product good enough? Right. Whatever that means, good enough to pull that other person who was already there back into the hall the next right. time you're there, whether that's two weeks later or two years later. It is, unfortunately, my opinion that edu the educational, the music educational system in higher education is kind of failing us in many ways. But that's my opinion. That's a whole different thing, and we don't need to get into that. I, I, think, I agree with you there. And I think, you know, if there's any message that, you know, people can take away from this part of the conversation, it's that it is on you to make sure that you don't just coast in the music education and assume you're doing all the right things because you're following, you're jumping through their hoops. Because it, it can't prepare you for in that safe envir environment. Start messing with the real world, right? Like to 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 take on more projects, to you know be 
working towards faster preparation with excellent results, all of those different things you talked about, you know, audience building, um, recognizing that you're, you're not going to have classmates once you graduate that are necessarily coming to every concert. But at the same time, these are all your friends who will graduate and come to your concerts because they live near you or something like that. So, um, well, Whether or not the education system is doing it right, that is something important that everyone needs to take on. It, it, you have to before you're just, you know, shocked by, by how it all really works. It's, like, it's a balancing act. Like, on the one hand, your education, time and education is an incredible gift to spend 15,000 hours just practicing. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's not going to last forever. And, like, you need to prepare for when it's gone. And balancing that is, I think, a little different for everyone, but I think it's mostly important to know that you should be balancing it and not just, you know, just doing one or the other. You want to be involved in school and, and using that time wisely, but you also need to be thinking about the future.